How's it going, patrons? Thanks for uh, being a patron. Really appreciate it. Jove Vitstens agreed to come on and do a little special interview just for you. And uh, Jove, I, I was wondering if, well, thanks for being here. <laughs> yeah, thank you for having me again. And I was wondering, or we were just talking a little bit about like your practice with site swaps and kind of how you approach site swaps. So I was wondering if you could uh, talk about that for a little bit. Yeah. Uh, yeah, with site swaps, I don't know. I, f I always felt for me the most important things with uh, site swap was to keep really uh, the beat in mind. Because uh, the beat is kind of the basis for all site swap, even if it's sync or if it's async. It still relies on having this. Uh, yeah, constant beat all the time, uh, where every ball lands. Uh, yeah, if you're doing async, you're gonna land on a specific beat all the time. So that's where the heights are really important. Mm. Uh, because uh, I see a lot of people do uh, side swaps, but they kinda, uh, what me and Lewis described it as is, we call it fudging. Uh, and a fudge is basically when you uh, kinda squeeze in throws mm -hmm. that you actually don't really have time to do. Mm -hmm. For instance, uh, if you juggle 6x4 like this, you can kind of wait a bit and force yourself back into uh, a fireball cascade. Mm -hmm. um, and we call that a fudge because it's not really valid side swap. You just kind of, um, you kind of, uh, yeah, mix up the dwell time on the hands a bit and the heights a bit mm -hmm. to make it like uh, easy to transition into something else. Uh, and I see a lot of people do this with uh, normal side swaps too, uh, that they don't really pay much attention to the heights of the pattern mm. or how long the ball is in the air before it's caught again, mm -hmm. uh, which makes them have these weird rhythms, maybe like a gallop rhythm mm. for some patterns and mm -hmm. are really like stressed on another one. Um, so I think this is really, uh, really important to figure out how long is this ball going to be in the air. And, uh, I usually think about it like, uh, uh, let's say you have a metronome, mm -hmm. and you say that, uh, so this is a one, this is going to take one bit uh, to get back and forth between the hands. Mm -hmm. So it's a one, 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 one. You can count these beats as one, two, three, four. And then it's important to keep in mind that the two is going to last exactly twice as long as that one. Mm -hmm. So it's one, one. Two. That's a two. This one. So it uh, and it also really works out with the uh, high throws um, too. Uh, a practice I usually teach in my uh, uh, if I have a master class or a workshop is uh, uh, a technique that um, was taught to me by Kristen Vanvik uh, that they used to do in Kiev at the circus school there, mm. um, which was an exercise. Um, he was calling it like to calibrate height throws, mm -hmm. but I really like to uh, think of it as figuring out the right heights for side swap instead. Um, so what it basically basically is is you know the um, uh, the common exercise where you do like a flash and you clap, mm -hmm. right? Instead of you doing the clap, you can do a, a bam bam on your um, on your legs instead mm -hmm. to kind of separate the beats because if you throw a flash, you have uh, Either a zero zero that you have two two throws that aren't really there, or you have a two two. So you can use this with empty hands to do bam bam. Mm. And with this, you can figure out how high it's gonna be. Let's say you have this. Okay, I'm gonna try to adjust the camera a bit <laughs> so you can see where I'm clapping. Yep. So um, if this is the rhythm, you're gonna have two of these under. And then mm -hmm. you catch this up. Bam bam bam. Mm -hmm. Bam bam bam. And with the four, it should be bum, 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 bum. Yeah, it's it's not high enough to do it here, but <laughs> if you get the picture, yeah. keeping the same beat under a high throw, mm -hmm. uh, if you manage to catch it on the beat again at the right amount of beats, that's the perfect height according to that beat. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So that's something to keep in mind. So you practice out, like, that with one ball first? Uh, I used to do it uh, a long time ago. Uh, I think it really helped me get like a feel for how to do side swap, or at least make it more uh, intuitive, I guess. Um, because after a while, when you learn a lot of side swaps, um, I guess you don't really think that much about how high you're throwing. You just know it's going to work according to when they're going to land, basically. Uh, uh, 
so you kind of can improvise the side swipe a bit too. Uh, you get to know, yeah, you kind of know uh, how high uh, the ball balls are going and also how long they're in the air. And uh, it's something to practice in the beginning, at least. Uh, I think it's really important to get the feel for the heights and the beats. And after that, it's easier to do different kind of throws after each other too. Because if you keep the right heights and the right uh, yeah, speed or the beat, they're going to land at the right time. I mean, it's going to be easy to get into a pattern again. But if they're like fudged, uh, mm -hmm. like slightly weirder heights, it's going to be like you need to correct a bit before you can go back into the pattern. Which uh, is, uh, I think, one of the main reasons why a lot of people find side swaps really complicated. Yeah. But then it's important to break them down into, yeah, I mean, smaller, more digestible parts, I guess. Yeah. Uh, would it be helpful to do, like, say you're working on a, on a nine and you, you work on it with one ball and then um, and then work on it with two balls, still like doing, except like doing two nines, but then still hitting your legs in between? Yeah, it could be uh, possible. Uh, it kind of forces you to think a bit about uh, keeping the same rhythm. Uh, it's good for like, let's say uh, you want to practice a five of pirouette with five balls. Um, if you do this bump, bump under on the zeros, um, you kind of get a feel for how long you have to do the pirouette. Which should also be the same with like nine balls. Say you throw one up and you do yeah, eight claps on your feet mm -hmm. to get like that right beat. That will kind of indicate a bit how fast you want to throw the nine pattern. Mm -hmm. Because if it works with the claps, uh, it should work with the, with the actual pattern too. Right. And another reason why I think uh, these claps on the legs are uh, a good idea uh, compared to this, which I think is a terrible idea in the first place, um, because this doesn't really represent the throw at all. It's like you throw a flash and then you're supposed to go up and clap and go down again, mm. which doesn't really make any sense if you think about it in relation to like any real juggling. Yeah. Um, except maybe doing like a 2x, 2x, I don't know. Um, but but these are really like, you throw from here normally in juggling, and this is just where you turn your hand and touch it. Mm -hmm. So it really corresponds well to when the ball is going to land in your hand, not when you have like empty hand hands right. like this. Right. So um, hmm. I think it's a nice idea to just go away from the claps, if that's what you're used to, and try yeah. doing separate two beats instead. Yeah, because when I've practiced but, with the claps... Um, I would say it's actually sort of encouraged the fudging. Um, exactly, I, it's I, like bum bum. Yeah, yeah. Um, is there any is there any time when fudging is acceptable? Yeah, uh, fudging is super interesting uh, actually, uh, and I think there's done very little research on it. Mm. Um, what I'm thinking about is like, um, let's say you go from one side swap to another. You sometimes might need like a, a transition throw or a few transition throws to go from one to the other. But there are ways of fudging into it, which doesn't really require any um, transition throws. Um, like, I don't know, fudging into 6x4 from a cascade is totally possible. Mm -hmm. uh, also from 6x4 to a cascade. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of other patterns too. Uh, I think it's really interesting to uh, I'm I've been working a bit on this uh, these kind of things where I let's say you do an async pattern and you change a couple of the throws into a uh, sync so they will land at the same time mm. and then they are ready for doing like a sync exchange that might go into async again mm -hmm. so you get these uh, patterns that are a mix of async and sync mm -hmm. and I guess in some way you can call it fudging mm -hmm. um, and I. Uh, I think I think there's cool possibilities with those kind of um, patterns too. Yeah, uh, people usually stick to just sync or async, but I think there's uh, definitely room for for creating stuff that yeah has yeah. both of them. Yeah, I think it's it's I think one reason it's unexplored is because it's it's just it's so quick, like it and it's you know it's yeah it would be hard to keep consistent. But I don't know. I think about it in like music terms just because i have some music background um mm. you know like i would say like our normal a normal throw in sight swap might be like a quarter note but then when you yeah. throw like an, an eighth note or a 16th note like i just noticed this morning mike moore posted a 
um, upside down box video where he did orbits and it's oh, yeah. like his hands are moving so quick. Like, you know, it's, yeah. Um, but you know, it's still considered, I don't know what, I don't even know. I don't know how you can really apply site swap to upside down box with orbits, but uh, yeah. Another thing, uh, maybe I'm just uh, talking too much, but, uh, it's something that's really interesting, I think, is dwell time, which is also uh, really underexplored, I think, because there's like, um, because like sideswap is all about how long um, the the balls are in the air, right? And before they land again, how many beats it takes. But you can also think of it, the time you're holding a ball is also a time that's uh, it's included in the sideswap. Like if you're holding the ball for um until the very last minute before you throw it or if you throw it very very quickly it's like the most extreme would be not releasing it at all and just tapping it like this so you get this slap back this would be like mm-hmm. min- minimum dwell time mm-hmm. and so let's say you do two uh you do a high throw but you have a very very low dwell time both on the throw and the catch mm-hmm. that high throw could be a lower throw in side sweep. Mm-hmm. Well, if you have a you throw a low ball which you hold extremely long before you throw it and also catch it super slowly, that could be a higher throw. So, mm-hmm. which I think it would be uh, that's really interesting that you can do a, a five three one where the tree is actually the highest throw, mm. uh, mm-hmm. but just because it has very very uh, short uh, dwell time, yeah. it can be yeah stuff like that too. So. Yeah. That's I, I find it interesting. About. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, uh, transitioning a little bit from this technical site swap talk, uh, you said you mentioned that you might be interested in talking a little bit about the community before it before YouTube and uh, Facebook. Yeah. Uh, definitely. Uh, something I wanted to talk about the last interview. Um, because it's, uh, I think there, there's a lot of new jugglers uh, on the internet now. Uh, maybe people have started out because of Facebook or they were introduced uh, through YouTube or I don't know, lots of different stuff um, that really only know Facebook and YouTube as the places to find, uh, find juggling. Mm-hmm. So I was talking about in the last interview how I like, I did a four ball shower before I did a three ball cascade. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, it was also because we we didn't really have any uh, any good internet at home. We only used uh, dial up. Mm-hmm. Uh, we didn't have a broadband at that point, so we didn't really use it for anything uh, special. So it never really occurred to me that I could search at juggling on the internet. Mm-hmm. This was back when I was like, yeah, uh, between six and eight, six and nine years old, anyways. Mm-hmm. Um, but I remember when I moved, I moved to London for uh, two years just because my dad uh, uh, was working there, uh, or he uh, he got the job there, and uh, uh, we lived there, and uh, then we finally got broadband internet, and after that, kind of like everything changed because I could be on the internet for as long as I wanted, mm-hmm. and uh, then I started really searching up juggling and making so many discoveries there Mm -hmm. and it was really the first time I discovered that the internet was full of juggling Um, and I I think I got a I probably spent a couple of hours or more uh, every day just like reading about juggling watching videos (laughs) uh, that kind of stuff and but it was super different than what it is today on YouTube because all the videos were like scattered around on uh, different private servers here and there, mm-hmm. and uh, there was no streaming back then, so all the videos had to be downloaded. Mm-hmm. And uh, you probably remember internet uh, 15 years ago; it was it was super slow, and to download um, a juggling video, uh, maybe uh, maybe it was five minutes or three minutes. It, it would take like literally a couple of hours to download. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I remember setting. Uh, I remember Kaza, and I would set. Oh yeah. I would set songs. I would set like twenty songs to download at nighttime, and maybe ten would be done when I woke up. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it, it it took ages. Yeah. And 
Yeah, I remember I had Casa Casa too. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but in a sense, it always um, it felt like it was uh, worth the download mm. because uh, here on uh, if you're on YouTube, you can kind of skip a bit to the middle and you can uh, you can see what other people have written as comments and. You really have a lot of info about the video before you even um, uh, watch it because people have shared it and it's like, yeah, this is great. I love this trick as the 3.1 and that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. But uh, back then it was really just, I have no idea what this is, right. but I'm going to download it and I'm going to watch it and it's going to be awesome. Yeah. So, uh, so do you think that helped you to value it more? Yeah, uh, maybe. And also because it took so so long to do it uh, or to download it uh, it really made me like watch the video over and over again and uh, really trying to like yeah, pull out as much I could from the video I guess um, and and uh, yeah I would just watch it on uh, on repeat basically and when I was waiting for uh, other videos to download, I would just juggle or read about some other juggling or, uh, yeah, do something completely different. Right. Uh, and uh, I remember I was really afraid that someone was going to cancel my download. <laughs> um, like because one of your parents? On, on, yeah, exactly, <laughs> because it was on my uh, my dad's uh, uh, work PC. Oh, uh, okay. And uh, it had these tabs down here in the corner that said, like, yeah, Thomas D, it's one, downloading, and... Uh, Chris Fowler downloading and I made this um, background on the computer that I like edited in uh, paint that had like text that said do not click out these downloads <laughs> that's funny and of course yeah. I don't know about you but we only had one phone line when I was younger so if I was downloading yeah. something that meant that no one could use the phone so yeah oh, that, that wasn't a problem but uh, still took for um, still took ages yeah Cool. So, uh, what, one last question. Uh, when in those beginning times, obviously the community wasn't as, as it was harder to be involved in community to have like a close friend juggler. Um, but what was one juggler that you kind of, you latched onto and, uh, followed? Um, so, uh, yeah, there's a really funny story, uh, about that. Um, because like when I lived in London and I moved back to Norway two years later, I, I never had really met any jugglers uh, in real life except uh, a few guys that could do three balls, four balls, like nothing special. And uh, I moved back to Stavanger where I'm from originally. And uh, I just uh, went online and searched for like uh, Stavanger juggling. And I found out that there was a juggling, juggling group, uh, juggling club here in uh, yeah in this in the city so uh, and i also saw that there was a festival that was called like the best coast festival and i was like whoa this is awesome and i uh, i go I go online and i find this guy's phone number and i call him and he's like yeah we're going to practice uh, on thursday at this time uh, just meet up on the on the big like area in front of the church in the in the centrum and that's where we usually hang out and juggle because this was like in the middle of the summer. And I remember like my dad uh, dropping me off in the um, city. And this was like I was 13, yeah, I, I, 12, 13 years old. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just see like over there on the on the big field, I see a guy just running seven clubs. And I'm like, what? <laughs> what is this? Like. Uh, I see, and and he's doing it like at good runs too, like forty, fifty catches, and I'm like, whoa, is that's this awesome. level? Is this the level that's in uh, Norway? Mm -hmm. And I I walk up to this guy and I'm like, whoa, and I try to say like, hi, I'm uh, I'm Hovar, uh, who are you? And he was really like shy, so he didn't really talk to me, um, and uh, yeah, he was just he was just juggling there a bit. And then another guy came up um, that I realized afterwards was the guy that I called because first oh, yeah. I thought this seven club guy was the guy that I um, uh, that I called, uh, but obviously it wasn't him. It was this other dude who uh, could do a bit of five clubs and uh, that kind of stuff. But I was totally blown away by the seven clubs. And 
uh, it was actually Toby Walker that oh, was yeah. there. Um, <laughs> That's so cool. Because, because he was uh, coming to the convention that was like um, uh, a week later. And uh, yeah, Toby has also uh, worked in Norway a bit before. Uh, uh, he lived in Oslo for a while. Um, yeah, but he was there and he was juggling and I, yeah, yeah I was totally starstruck. Like I, I thought it was this Norwegian juggler and that I was like, totally shit in comparison to him but yeah. uh, that's super cool uh, yeah that's awesome what a, so what a fun it, toby I, was uh, yeah toby is definitely was a huge inspiration and he came back to norway also like three or four times after so i got to hang hang out with him a lot yeah that was cool it's really it's really interesting i don't know I, it makes me kind of realize that we take kind of being in relationship with or knowing or seeing the the skills of all these jugglers now for granted when before that was so it was so much less common um and so much more yeah. exciting when you had those opportunities so yeah well i think that's enough for now thanks uh thanks again for yeah. coming on i wish we could just keep talking but you know yeah there's a time <laughs> limit on these extra interviews yeah <laughs> and, uh, too bad <laughs> yeah well We'll definitely need to get you back on, maybe on a panel discussion with some other jugglers. Um, yeah, that would be sweet. Yeah, we should. Uh, maybe we should do a Scandinavian jugglers. Uh, I like, uh, I like uh, it. Yeah, panel. <laughs> All right, cool, yeah, man. We can set that up. Cool. Well, thanks for the extra interview. Thanks for being on, and uh, yeah. everybody else, thanks for watching and for being a patron. Yeah.